Hi. Hi, everyone. How are you guys doing today? And I already asked you guys, but I'm hoping to see some good mole puns for the stream since we're drawing a mole. Let me go ahead and finish up. Uh, part of the reason I was just pushing something out right now, which is if you check below the stream, you can see how there's a now chalky brush. If you refresh the page, there should be a chalky brush download. So I made the two brushes that I'm going to be using during the stream today available to you guys if you want to work with them and possibly have kind of like a chalky finish to your illustrations. So that is what I just put out there. So let me go ahead and finish up posting on the marketing side. If you guys want to put where you're watching from, I always love seeing where you guys are watching from. And then we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you guys. And definitely let me know if you can hear me all right. Okay. Well, thank you, Little Ruin, for following, even though we haven't done much yet to really uh, impress you yet, but thank you. Okay, I think I am good to go. Let me double check everything. And okay. All right, so officially, hi everyone. Well, well, I thank you, oh, Owl Bear Bergs, for following. But hello, everyone. I'm Tim Von Rieden, and I'm with CG Cookie Concept, and we do these live streams every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Central Time. I usually post what the topic is about it two hours beforehand, and hopefully I tell you a week in advance during this stream what I will be doing next week. And next week, I will actually be doing the complicated fabric folding stream because it was requested. If you look below, we now have a little section for... Uh, requests and that was one that I thought would be a really great one to do because I love folding fabric I think it's one of the coolest things to draw if you uh, just do it right I think there I used to do it wrong and you really have to give fabric liberty to have some sharp angles even though with fabric you always think smooth and fluid uh, with actual folding cloth there's actually a lot of angles so I'm gonna go over that next week if you want to see that but today we are going to be doing a painterly mole drawing. And the reason for it is because right now the whole CG Cookie crew is working on a video game and we're trying to push out a demo by the end of the year. So right now we're in this really like interesting state where uh, all of us have never really worked on a game before. So we're learning what it takes to make a game as a crew. And uh, I've, I, I, took what I originally thought I would, my role would be of more of like a character designer. And I've been pushed more into of an art direction and a level designer. So it's been a really interesting run for me. I definitely can tell you I'm not comfortable with doing environments. So I think maybe one of the streams in the next few months, I'll do an entire environment stream and just talk about the frustrations I've had with doing environments. And then what I've, the steps that I've taken to learn environments. And hopefully by then I'll be a little better than I am right now. Okay, so let me go ahead. And thank you all for saying where you're from. It's so cool to see everyone where they're from. And yes, I, I do, I would be very grateful if I saw some mole puns in the stream today. Before we start though, I just wanna give a quick update. I will be participating in what is called Drawloween 2016. And I've been always curious about doing this. I don't really want to do Inktober because I'm not a big inker, but this is kind of like a pencil alternative or you could even do this digital. So if you guys are planning on doing this, I think I'm going to submit all of the drawings I do per day on the community site. And I'm really excited to get started on that. Uh, there'll be no stream on September 28th. I will actually be in London. I went and got my pounds this morning. And what was really cool is I feel like America has such boring money compared to other countries. Uh, it's, it's really neat. But essentially, I'm going over there because a few of you community guys actually set up, including Tijel and Jensen, you guys are set up this 
hangout in which you have rented a house in London for a week end and I want to be there with you guys. So that'll be really fun. I've never been to Europe before and it'll be a nice introduction because I'm planning to be there a lot next year for conventions. And lastly, uh, if you guys missed the beginning, I put a download link to the brushes I will be using below the stream. So if you want to download these chalky, chalky brushes uh, for your illustrations, if you want kind of like a painterly result, but this is a bit more of a chalky finish, then you can go ahead and download that dot .abr file. And if you have any questions, please put at CG Cookie Concept before your question. And my question to you guys today is, have you ever worked in a painterly style? I think there's a lot of things that you can learn from doing a painterly style, and I'll talk about it while I'm actually working on the mole here. But I'm curious if you guys have ever tried it. And if you haven't, I highly suggest you at least try it once. There's a lot that can be learned from it. Okay. So now I'm going to show you my original sketch. And I'll, I'll kind of talk you through my process of working from traditional to digital with this new kind of uh, style that I've been working with for this Don't Eat Sheep game that we're working on. Okay, so I, if you guys know me, you know that I really love... Uh, oh, wait, hold on, let me <laughs> read the comments. And not, yes, I know. I, I Sorry, I didn't name all of you guys, but I'm really excited to meet everyone. I think it should be a blast. I, I can't tell you how excited I am. Okay. So I really love working in pencil first. I found out I have come to known with myself. So I did a little sketch of the mole and it's based off of, uh, we had Joe actually doing some of the original mole uh, concepts and then I took his interpretation and then put on my kind of style on it to match what the game is gonna look like and then I did a paint over on top of it. So it's been kind of cool working from someone else's uh, concept art and then putting kind of a final polish on it. So, oh gosh, now Eve feels left out. I'm sorry. Everyone that I'm going to be in London with, I am so excited to meet you, and I can't wait to hang out with you guys. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. So, I just took a picture of it. I didn't do anything fancy with it, no hyper scanning or anything. And pretty much, I bring it into Photoshop, and as you can see in my layers, I wanna make sure you guys can see this. I'm gonna change this layer to multiply. Now you can see how it instantly gets darker, and since I have a gray background behind it, that's why it gets even darker than if I had a white background, and I do that because I want more of a neutral base to work off of. So the reason I'm turning it on to multiply is so that when we make a layer underneath of that layer, we can still see the initial line art that we had. So with our mole fellow, I'm gonna actually work Something like this. Let me. I'm gonna make sure I have the colors on the other screen here. So uh, usually when I do a concept like this, if it's of of a specific creature or animal, I usually like to do some research on it. I am very curious about uh, nature and the world that we live in. So the fun fact that I can tell you about moles for today, it's like the fun fact about animals, is that moles actually have two thumbs. And I did not know that beforehand. And they have two really giant, uh, like rabbit looking teeth. They're like squared off. And uh, they're they're very much, pretty much blind. They, they can't see too well in the daylight. <laughs> and I think that's why we try to represent that here. Initially I thought, uh, moles had like these big claws but they're actually just like extended fingernails and they're also kind of squared off so I try to bring that into what I'm working on and you'll see as we get into more detailing of the hands how we're doing that. Uh, Xeonard03 asked what kind of game is it going to be a platformer? Yes it is going to be a platformer and a lot of the goal with the game is not trying to be like this amazing over-the-top the revolutionary game. I think for us, it's more of a testament to, we want to prove the whole statement of if you can't do, you teach. And we want to show that not only do we teach, but we can still do. And uh, hopefully the end result will be something that we can be proud of and show at uh, conferences when we go and you, there's like an available demo to play. And if you want to buy the whole game, you can. But my whole goal with the whole game that we're making is to make a very colorful and visually intriguing end result. So I'm hoping that within the game, the end result will look like, if you've ever seen The Dam Keeper, that animated short by Tonko House, 
I love that the finished result looked uh, chalky. It had a painterly finish. And I'm pretty sure one of the questions before this one asked, what defines a painterly finish? Uh, I say painterly, and I really shouldn't be using that word choice, but when it comes to doing digital art, painterly pretty much implies that it has a traditional feel to it. And in this case, I want a traditional chalky feel. So that is what we'll be going for. So I'm just laying down a base coat. I'm not caring if I'm getting messy because that is not the purpose of our base coat here. And then his helmet, I initially did it as a black, but I think, well, I guess, no, we'll keep it the same dark color for now. I don't want to take too much attention away from his hands and his nose, which I want to be a very red subsurface scattered color look. So I think we're going to save kind of that saturated point for that section. Because if we make the, the helmet a very saturated, loud color, it kind of takes away from how cool the hands and the nose will look. Um, Eve says, by the way, we got a kiddie pool. <laughs> Did you even brought one? Uh, I am bringing my swimsuit, so I'm super pumped to go over there. Uh, Eve says, on the preview, I saw some glorious subsurface scattering on the nose and hands. Mind to show off later how you achieve that look? Absolutely. Uh, doing subsurface scattering is one of my favorite things to do, so I will definitely get to that. So now with my base coat, the mole is such a simple character that I really don't need to do too much more than this. I could add some of the hints. Let me, let me pull up the final so you guys can see what the result we're looking for. Something like this. You know what? I'm actually going to make this smaller and put it on the side. Because part of the reason I even chose... Oops. I wanted to copy this. There we go. Because part of the reason I even uh, wanted to do this for the stream, one, is so that I can show you guys uh, what we're doing with the game and do kind of a painterly look, because this is something that I think a lot of people are intrigued by, and I love I love doing character stuff like this. It's, it's very shapular, and I can really focus on the colors, and that's my favorite thing with digital art. So that was the first reason. But second reason is Kent le legitimately needs this concept done by Thursday, because he's going to start modeling it. And once he models it, I have to do... He's going to put a very basic diffuse texture on it. If you know what that means in 3D, it's like without any lighting, you just put a, a color on the character. And then if you put this character in a 3D world, that color would be what would be on that character. So then I get to do a paint over on that diffuse texture to make it feel a little bit more painterly. So I have to get this done like today. <laughs> so after the stream, I'll probably even have to do just a little turnaround so that Kent can see what he looks like from the back and just give a little more detail than just this front illustration drawing. And that's also why he's in such a basic pose. Because with concept art, you don't want to get too detailed and lose, or like if you have it super dynamic, you might lose some of the, like, the proportions. And uh, you want to make it as easy as possible for the 3D modeler to read what you're doing and translate it into 3D. Okay, so, oh yeah, so like I said, I might put some indication of the red underneath of him on the base, but I'm not going to do too much here. All right, so I'm going to make a new layer above that sketchbook layer. And now that we have our base done, since this is such a simple character, I really don't need to do too much foundation work and I can get into a lot of the paint over right from the start. So the colors that I chose for him and uh, initially, I was thinking more of like a bluish hue, but then the more that I started painting him, it came out to be a little bit more purple, a bit more gray. And I, I actually like that result better because then the subsurface scattering effect really pops out. And I've learned over the years how you want to attract the eye to the important parts of your piece. If you have so much detail and so much that is kind of grabbing or like demanding the viewer's attention, then the viewer won't know where to look and then it just becomes kind of an eyesore and you don't want that for your characters. Now that's not to say you can add like a lot of detail in it. Uh, it can still look awesome and you can still make it have a nice flow to it. But for such a simple character like this, you really want it to get to the point and have it read like immediately when the viewer looks at it. 
Um, Blue one 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 seven ask. I can't finish watching the stream due to me having an art history class in an hour. Will the stream be posted on YouTube as well as the one from last week? The one from last week, I was actually debating if I should put that one on YouTube or not, just because it's other people's art, and I didn't know if you guys would feel comfortable with me posting it on there. So I guess if you guys want to tell me now if you think I should post the critique stream that I did last week onto YouTube, then I will put it on YouTube. Right now it's on the archive of the Twitch channel, but I can definitely move that over into uh, YouTube. Now you can see like for his eyes, I made it a little lighter in that gray color and that's so that we can put more attention to the eyes and so that we can actually see the little slit where his eye will open even though it probably won't open in the game. Because part of the reason we're including these moles is if you know what our monster Melvin looks like, he kind of looks like this, but uh, a little different. This is one of the monsters that you can play as, but um, a Melvin is our main character. And he kind of has a similar shape as the moles, so the moles help you throughout the game because they think Melvin is a mole, and they can't tell that he's actually not a mole. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of the mole's purpose and why they're in the game in the first place and why they're helping. And Plus, they're just a cute little round potato that I can draw, so I love doing that. Uh, Christy McAvee says, what is the name of the mole? Uh, you know what, last night I was drawing with Key and Sean and Pui and Tyler, and I was doing like a test run of the mole, and they were like, Tim, what is the name of the mole? And usually I think of a name on the spot, and the one that came up was Henry, but it was a girl, and I can't, I still don't know if this is a girl or a boy mole, but I, I think it's a boy mole, but uh, if you guys have a better name than Henry, which I'm sure you do, uh, you can definitely put it in the comment section, because as of right now, he's still unnamed. And the brush that I'm using now is actually not the chalk brush, if this is what you guys may be wondering. It's a new brush that I created, and it has a bit more texture to it in between, where the chalk brush was more of like circles that were scattered or cut out. This one actually has more of a gritty edge. And the reason I like this is if I make it really big, it almost like implies a canvas texture underneath of the character. So I like using this one now for the eat sheep stuff or the don't eat sheep, I should be calling it. Uh, the Terminal Glow says, I know if it were my art you critiqued, I'd totally be fine with you posting on YouTube. Uh, Ms. Chibiar said, I'd love you to post a critique stream. I didn't get to see all of my critique because my internet lagged. Okay, then I think I will post it then. Thank you guys for letting me know. Oh, and I think I announced this on an earlier stream, but I just wanted to make sure I remembered. I will. I actually got accepted into Emerald City two weeks ago, and I will be in Seattle, Washington in March. So if any of you guys are out there and are thinking of going to Emerald City, I would love to meet you guys. Oh, now you guys are putting in the names here. Lord Jeffrey. <laughs> Lorna. Oh, I kind of like Lorna. It's a good little mole name. All right, let's get some of our lighter hues in here. And I'm trying to remember to not care if it looks perfect or not. I think that's something that I've really kind of overcome in the last year. And that's just like, putting on a slop of color and uh, value, making sure it looks good from that perspective first, and then getting into detailing. And I really have experimented with it enough where I know that it's a tried and true method of working, at least for me. So I know that I can put down a bunch of value and color first, and if it looks good from a value and lighting perspective, if that's my focus, then I can go into detailing. So I won't start detailing probably for another Probably like 15, 20 minutes here. Um, Aru Arundan says, Hey Tim, when did you start streaming? What made you start or what made you feel ready for it? And how nervous were you the first few times? So I've been doing this with CG Cookie for about three and a half years, I think it is. Three and a half or four. 
And uh, it was one of those on the whim things when I started with CG Cookie. They gave me Concept Cookie, which is what it was called at the time. To they they essentially said, "Here's a site. Do whatever you want with it, and make it grow." So I was looking at like what were professionals doing at the time, and I noticed that a lot of professionals were using live stream, and they were streaming their own work, and that was something that. I knew I probably should be doing. I didn't think I was ready for it at the time, but I was like, you know what? When do I ever feel ready for anything? And I just, I just did it one day. And I was like, you know what? Today's Wednesday, middle of the week. Just, <laughs> just do it. And I started doing them. At first, they were really long. They were like four-hour long streams. And it, it was because I was so, so much of a perfectionist of wanting something to be completely done by the end of the stream that I would make the stream go on super long. And I would only get like, 10 to 20 viewers back then. And to me, that was like everything. It wasn't so much the, the quantity of people, it was the quality. And they really inc were encouraging. And uh, I'm so thankful that they were there for the beginning part of me doing the streams because I think, ooh, well, I thank you, the, work, the worst janitor for following. <laughs> you, I swear, the Twitch names that you guys have are some of the funniest I've seen. Uh, so yeah, and you know, then we moved to Google Hangout and that was awesome for what we needed at the time where you could select questions and I really liked it. Uh, Joe was the moderator and it was just a fun time. And then, then we moved to Twitch and it was kind of a weird transition because we couldn't advertise through YouTube and that was where a lot of, I think the watchers were coming from. So I, was, I wasn't sure if people would get the notice of like where the new ones are, but uh, no, I've, I've really fallen in love with Twitch and what it offers. I love reading the comment section. I like the fact that we can make custom emojis, which I am planning to do probably the first week in October. So if you guys have some ideas for custom emojis that we can build, I, I definitely want to do that come October. But yes, I was very nervous back then, and I think... Now I, I don't really get nervous doing these live streams. If anything, I, I look forward to them. I like talking to you guys, and uh, these are actually kind of relaxing, which I know probably seems strange. But when I was in college, actually, I was really nervous to let anyone watch me draw. So it's just, it's very ironic for me to think hindsight of I'd be having people watch me draw every Wednesday and me not feel like, ah, oh, you, can't, you can't look at what I'm drawing and uh, cover it up immediately. I had to get over that real quick. All right, so you can see with these basic values in place, let's go ahead and start. Oh, you know what? I forgot his little feet, his little nubs down there. So you can see what we've done here. So I'm gonna make a new layer. And honestly, we're just gonna go for some subsurface scattering right now. Now, if you don't know what subsurface scattering is, essentially it's when light penetrates through an object. I'm going to do it with my hand here. And the light is able to penetrate, penetrate, and bounce around in the actual object itself. And in terms of, let's say we're talking about fingers here, it passes through and the light bounces within your finger. And what that does, it, it illuminates the blood vessels in your finger. So that's why when you hold up your hand to like a flashlight or something, it becomes very pinky looking. It looks fleshy colored. And that's because that light is saturating the color within your own finger, and that's why uh, it looks more red. But it doesn't just have to be on your hand. It can be with other things, like uh, if you had jello, <laughs> if you had like green jello, and light is passing through it, and then it falls into the shadow below. The light, when it passes within the jello, that's also a subsurface scattering. Pretty much anything that has like a translucent surface that you can see through it doesn't even have to be like complete glass see-through but enough where you can see within the object itself so in the terms of our mole here the light is going to be passing through his nose and his hands now i'm going to over exaggerate his hands just because i like the color placement of it i think it adds some more interest to it but if you look at a real mole their uh, fingers and their nose have more of a pinkish color and, oh, you know what? Let me actually grab a reference of a mole quick. And while I'm doing that, Nebula Fox says, why not Picardo TV? I actually looked into doing Picardo, but Twitch was just uh, the better fit in the end. 
But I still, I really like Picardo. So if you guys, this has been my reference for this mole. Let me show you guys. I think this is like the best reference I've ever worked from. Do you see this guy? This is like the happiest fellow I've ever met. But you can see how his nose is a bit more pink. And that reference is all right in terms of the subsurface scattering. Let me go ahead and show you the other one. Let me find it. Because that one had a bit more of, I think this is it, a bit more of that, like that reddish hue that comes with subsurface scattering. Well, I thank you, Irish Whiskey 92, for following. Where is that picture? Oh, okay. I think. I don't know. This is the other one. Okay. So then here is the one that kind of shows off more of like the subsurface scattering. So you can see within his hand, it's actually way more apparent than it is his nose. And that's why I really wanted to illuminate the hands to almost overemphasize the subsurface scattering. And there's a little bit on his nose, but uh, with this painting that we're doing in the mole, we get to have the freedom of kind of overdoing the the subsurface scattering, just because I, I really like the end result that it got. So I'm gonna zoom in. I forgot that uh, you guys can see it better when I zoom in. So with the nose, I definitely don't want there to be too much of like this very hot pinky color down here. I'm gonna pull some of the mole's color back up and then it's kind of like a back and forth of pulling it down and then pushing it back up. So I'm trying to find like that nice balance of where do I think the light would be passing through the most because as the nose gets thicker and further back, there's other elements within the nose that are blocking the subsurface scattering. So the thickness of his nose will actually make it be, it'll make it harder for the light to pass all the way through and for us to see. And that's why the light kind of stops like around here. Now on the very top of his nose, it's actually pink. And that's because it's reflecting the light. If we have a light coming in this general direction, like this, the light source would actually fall pretty strongly on the top of his nose. I'll make it not perfectly flat there. And then it would fall down. Now, I like having saturation really strong, like right where that shadow would begin. So in between where that light lands and the start of the subsurface scattering, I'm gonna make this really a vibrant red. I wonder if you guys can hear the raindrop started to piddle on the roof here. I love rainy days, especially when it's light out. Uh, yes, it's Tigel says, this mole looks so huggable, but I feel like he would bite your ear off while hugging. <laughs> Uh, maybe, I don't know. I feel like this mole is too nice to even know that it can like inflict violence with his hands, even though they're like tool shaped and almost weapon like. Uh, Nebula Fox says, did you know moles only come to the surface to die? Oh my gosh. No, I did not know that. Oh, that makes this picture all that it like totally changes the mood from this happy mole finally seeing the light to, well, he's seeing the light, but he's also dying. <laughs> uh, K Z says, will the next game have a book art like the previous game? Yes, uh, it definitely will. But I definitely need to focus on making the art for it before we even think about making a uh, book for it. <laughs> Because this game will be a lot bigger and have a lot more to it than the first one did. Okay, so now in my original drawing, I actually threw in some bounce lighting and gray tones in the mouth area. I'm going to not do that with this one. I actually like having the red colors pretty much separate the forms just by themselves. And I like that subtlety. But I will add... 
little lighter pink on the top to kind of indicate that it's wet, wetter. Well, I thank you. Oh, I lost it. Whoever just followed, thank you so much. I gotta keep this open on the other screen. There we go. So, uh, what was I just talking about? Oh, the on the top, I'm making it a little lighter in some areas. You can see how I did it over there too. Just to indicate that the light is falling on it and it has more of like a reflective surface. It's slightly more wet. You can see how in the reference images, it just, it reflects the light a lot more than his fur does because fur tends to absorb lighting. Oh, <laughs> uh, all you guys are talking about how sad it is. That is really sad. I did not know that. Oops, someone said, um, Eve says, how do you go about choosing your colors for subsurface scattering? Sometimes I just can't seem to find the right color. So when it comes to subsurface scattering, usually using reference is always best. Now, in the case that you don't have reference or you're trying to just do it on your own to like test your knowledge of it, the way that I see subsurface scattering is make it more vivid and vibrant because when that light passes through, especially if you're working with something that's fleshy or if you're doing like a hand specifically, or even like a nose or the back of the ear, add saturation to it. Because the way that that light is bouncing around, it's actually making the colors more vibrant. So I tend to choose more saturated colors. Well, I thank you, the Fargan art, for following. So now I'm gonna bring that down into his hands. And the way that we decided to build his hands were that they'd be more blocky. And then, oops, I'm gonna actually make this smaller in the middle. To kind of represent his block fingernails. And also to add more of a shapular design to his hands. So we're gonna block these out here. I'm gonna do a fade up. And just remember, when it comes to this kind of stuff, blending it will be your best friend. So I never dwell too long on if it looks perfect, because I know that when we get into the actual detailing of the, the piece, that's when we can focus on how smooth does it look or does the transition look right. But right now, I'm just looking at, does it look good from like a silhouette, from a value standpoint? That's the only thing that I'm really caring about. Something like that. Actually, this hand, I'm going to bring this forward a touch more. And I'm just giving it an outline so that I can see what I'm doing a little easier. Um, Aronadan says, man, you always sound so happy when someone follows. Now I feel sad I subscribed in between screen streams. Uh, no, that's awesome. Thank, thank you for subscribing. Uh, it's one of those things where with Google Hangout, you could never see, well, people couldn't subscribe to you, obviously. So when we switched to Twitch, it was like this new thing of uh, a, a subscriber would follow and we'd have a little prompt. And I felt like I should be thanking everyone that follows. And I, I do, like, thank you guys for coming to watch these streams every week. Like, they are really fun for me to do. And I hope they're fun for you guys and hopefully you get a good laugh or two from them. Yes, it's Tigil says, is the regular chalk brush? Because it looks more angled. You might have mentioned this before. I had some leg the first few minutes. Yes, this is actually my new brush which is very similar to the chalk brush, but it has more of a gritty texture feel to the edges where the chalk brush, if you look closely, it's more of like circles that are cut out in different sections and it leaves 
I still like and love the chalk brush, but it's quite not it's not quite as textured as this new one. And if I make this one bigger, it really leaves the impression of the canvas underneath. And with digital, it's kind of a cool effect because obviously there is no real canvas, so I like using this brush for the eat sheep stuff. Oh man, can you guys hear the rain? It's really pouring in right now. Okay, so then now I'm at the point where I'm going to go ahead and start adding some lighter values on top of his hands here. And since the light is coming from this direction, I'm having the light land on the top of his hand because that's how it would actually land in uh, this little scene that we've created. Not so much under here because the light wouldn't be going that far down. At least not with the angle that we've chosen. Uh, James Frio says, how did you get the prompt for the new followers? It's actually, actually a website service called Stream Pro. And from there, you can go ahead and set up like even the little PNG that we have down below with the bar that says cgcookie.com and the new follower count, all that. So that is where we got that from. Oh, you guys can't hear that rain? Wow. I promise I'm not going crazy, but yeah, it's definitely raining. Okay, I think we're at the point where, let's go ahead and start working on the hat that he's wearing. Now, the hat's going to be different than the way that I treated the fur because I want to imply more of like a reflective surface. So when I go onto the hat here, let me grab a very dark blue. I'm going to first lay down my base. And then I'm going to add in just like a slight bounce light reflection. And then whenever we add in these highlights, it'll really pop those out. Uh, Tan Lighting says, what an adorable mole I have just come across just now. Uh, in real life or in the drawing? If it's in real life, I don't know if you're outside watching this stream or where you're at. Blue one, one one seven says, "I heard the rain. You aren't crazy. See, they said it. I'm not crazy." So I'm gonna make a new layer for this, and I'm gonna show you guys how very subtle highlights can actually add a huge effect onto your piece. I'm gonna go. Now with something that's super reflective, I try to be very minimal with my highlights. So be mindful of where you're placing it and how much you're placing it. Well, I thank you, Vijek, for following. Something like that. Now I'm gonna get a little darker on this part of the helmet. Cause with metals, I try to have a transition from light to dark, light to dark, to light to dark. And you pretty much just have that contrast going on constantly with your metals and reflective surfaces. And that's what will really give it more of a sheen to it overall. Oops, let me close that. There we go. Oh, and there was something else I wanted to tell you guys. The uh, On the Community Suggest forum that we have below, someone suggested that I do the elements 
Well, I thank you, Guten Dog, for following. And I think throughout the month of November, I want to do a different element each week. So like one week would be water, one would be fire, one would be uh, the earth, and the last would be ice. I think I got caught up in my own elements. Fire, water, earth, air. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure I get that right, but I, I think I will do like an element per week. So if you guys are very interested in like element drawing, then I would come for the November live streams. And I'll definitely give full credit to whoever suggested that. Okay. Now for his little glass panel up here, we're gonna leave it more open so it's not actually like on, it's off, but the glass texture on the inside, we're gonna give more of like a ridged glass look to it. So to do that, pretty much you just need to be very conscious of placement of your highlights and that will do the trick for you. You can see how you can keep it really subtle, but it really does define the look of glass. Something along those lines. Okay, now you may have noticed he doesn't have eyes yet. And I think that's part of the reason he's looking so unfinished. So let's go ahead, make a new layer. Oh, and let me show you what that highlight layer did to the helmet. So you can see before and after how it goes from looking pretty flat into something that is a bit more rounded out. I think I could push this further. And you know what, maybe I, I will really quick. It's so like the bottom of his helmet here, you would get some bounce light off of the mole and then it would land on the inside of this hat. And I really should be calling it a helmet. That's more or less what it is. Something like that, and then even on the top, I'm gonna go ahead and lighten it up there as well. Because I try not to over render metal, because if you start to over rendering, if you start to uh, put too much detail and render it into it, it starts to look a bit chaotic, and you really want it to mesh well with the light source that you have in the scene. So I try not to overdo it. Let me give it more of a sheen there. Like that. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and go to the eyes here. So for the mole's eyes, uh, in the the example one that I did, I actually didn't like the placement of his eyes. I kind of like this one a bit better. Um, it's like somewhere in between the finished one that I did last night and the original sketch. So I'm gonna go ahead. And put them in between those two areas. So I'm gonna just grab a darker color. And every time I grab a color, I'm pushing down option on a Mac and that's alt on a PC. And that brings up your eyedropper tool. I'm just picking from the colors that we already laid down, and I'm going to go ahead and drop it here. And I'm giving it a little bit more of an arch than I did with my original one, just to imply the happy, cute look. And I think that works well for this type of a character. And then I'm going to grab a lighter gray color to go around his eye. And actually, we can just put it on the layer underneath like that. So I really wanna focus on the subtleties in the facial expression. So the eye, we had that slight curve, and now with the mouth, we also wanna bring it up, but not like super crazy high, 
but just enough so that he doesn't look, he like right now he looks a little bit clueless. We want to change that. So let's go ahead and just tilt it up. And it's, it's very subtle, like look at before and after. Oops. Oh, I have to redo that eye. Sometimes with uh, Cintiq, if you touch on the screen with your hand, it actually captures that. And that's why we had that giant gray line going across his face. Uh, Blue1117 asks, have you ever thought about purchasing an iPad Pro with the Apple Pencil? I keep hearing great reviews about the pencil making it feel like sketching in a sketchbook. That is actually on my list of things to buy, so yes. I tested it out because I was a little skeptical because I was like, why wouldn't I just get a Cintiq Companion? But then I tested it out and it really changed my whole opinion about the iPad Pro. And I, I really liked the feel of the pencil. It felt like I was sketching in an actual sketchbook. So I don't think I would use it for a lot of color definition or if I was going to render something out. But in terms of like just pure sketching or if I like went to life drawing with it, I would definitely use the iPad Pro. All right, so let me redo that mouth area since I had to erase it. Something like that. Now his eye feels a little too perfect, so I'm gonna messy it up with the brush. Uh, Eve says, with AstroPad, you can mirror your Mac screen on the iPad. That way you can have photo, full Photoshop on it. Oh, I did not know that, actually. Yeah, because I think right now it's not compatible, so you have to use, I think it was Sketchbook Pro. I'm not sure, though. But I remember, yeah, you weren't able to use Photoshop on it right away. And I think that was the main reason that I didn't want to get it. But then after testing out the software that was on the iPad Pro, I really liked it. Okay, so on a new layer, I'm going to go ahead and let's make his cheeks a little bit more rosy. So now the color I laid down was a bit too light, so I'm just going to open my hue and saturation menu with command U, but if uh, you want to find it on the top menu bar, it's under image, adjustments, hue saturation. So I'm just going to make it slightly darker, something like there, because I don't want too much attention being taken away from what we had on the hands and the nose. Now, I should be flipping my image a lot more than I have been this stream, so I have mine set up to a keyboard shortcut. I definitely recommend you guys doing that so that it keeps your eyes fresh on what you're working on. But let's go ahead and start separating this character from our background here. I'm making the brush smaller because as much as I love the texture look and feel, when we're separating the character out from the background, I don't want to have such a textured outline that we actually start to lose the shape of the character himself. So I can go in after and add in more of a texture if there's areas that I feel need a bit more, but right here I want to be focused more on keeping the shape of our character. So like here on the cheek, I felt like I lost some of that roundness. So here with my eraser then, I can go and add that back in. Now whenever I'm working on something that's so shapular, I always imagine it in a 3D space, whether that's like a 3D program or as like an actual vinyl toy. So in this case, I'm kind of imagining him as a toy and how he would actually reflect lighting. 
but then I'm going to put more of a painterly touch on top of them. So I can add more fantastical colors on top. But for actually trying to keep him round, I think I try to always picture it in a 3D space. Uh, not a clickbait says, off topic, but have you played Overwatch? I have not, actually. I, I've seen all the art for it, obviously, but I have not played it. I, I haven't really played a video game in about a year and a half. I know that sounds kind of crazy. Uh, every now and then I'll play like Mario Kart or if uh, my friends want to challenge me to something along those lines, I will. But the last game I think I really actually played played was Splatoon when that came out last year. Oh, no, actually, I forgot. Over the weekend, one of my requirements for, it was like my homework for work, was to play a video game, and it was Inside. It's the new indie game that if you have heard of it or played it, it's uh, gotten a lot of really great reviews, and my boss told me I had to play it and take notes about the camera angles and the way that the foreground elements were interacting in between the character and the player's view. So it was a really interesting uh, playthrough just because I haven't played a video game in so long and it was fun. Uh, I won't spoil anything, but I will say the last like 20% was by far my favorite. I think that was so innovative and uh, interesting that I think that's what really kind of hooked me and uh, got my attention. Uh, Tigel says, oh my God, Eve, that brush is so awesome. Download it now. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's been a really good brush for me so far. I, I really do like it. Uh, James Frio says, have you played Undertale? Much recommend. I've watched someone play a bit of it, and I know all the art from it just because when I go to conventions, you just see the skeleton brothers and this flower uh, that turns evil and, like, the dog with the extending neck. So, like, I, I see the references everywhere, and I know that that's from Undertale, and I know what the game's all about, but I have not played it myself. It looks super awesome, though, just from what I've seen. Uh, Nori just says, do you really benefit from the touch function from the Cintiq? I'm kind of surprised that you chose the one with that touch, fu touch function. To be honest, so am I. I really didn't think I like would like the touch function, but the main thing that I use it for is zooming in and out, and I use that constantly. So I have to admit, I do like the, the feature, but if you really don't think you'll be using that that much, then honestly, I wouldn't recommend getting the touch over the regular version because uh, it, there is quite a significant price difference between uh, without the touch and with the touch that it, it might not even be worth it if you're hardly ever going to use it. All right, let's see here. I'm going to flip it again. Okay, so now... Let me clean up this edge here. All right, so now I can go in on top of all of this, and if I want to add more of like a textured outline, I can do that here. And I like to keep it more soft. I don't like to have a crazy defined texture outline. But every now and then I do, so I don't know. It just depends on what mood I'm in. And I, I'm sure you guys feel the same way when you're working of like, do I want this piece to be more smooth looking or do I want it to have more of a texture feel? Don't feel like you have to like put yourself in one box and be like, I can never come out of this. Like I can only do textured stuff for the rest of my life because that's not the way that art should be. It should be more intuitive and in, uh, what you're feeling. Okay, so I'm going to make a new layer here, and why don't, oop, you can see like here, this is what I'm talking about, how every now and then the touch feature actually gets in the way because my finger will touch the screen, not the pen, and it will actually react to it as if it were a pen and leave down a brush stroke. So I'm going to go ahead and erase that. All right, so now from here, it's just kind of defining some of the edges for my 3D modeler, Kent, so that he can look at this image and immediately know how thick areas should be. But I'm trying not to lose that texture effect we have everywhere. And I think part of the challenge here 
is to add in edges without them being super tight or distracting. Oh, and some other good news. I, um, well, if you were here at the beginning, you know that I have actually, I will be doing Draw Halloween 2016. Halloween and me are like peaches and pie. We are one and the same. I love Halloween so, so much. And we will actually have a lot of surprises for you guys in October. Uh, obviously the contest, but there's other things that I want to do for you guys during the month of Halloween that are, it's not so much a trick, it's definitely a treat. And I have a few of my friends coming for a good stay of October. Actually, if you guys remember Sean from a few weeks back, we did a live stream with him. He will be here for most of the month of October and the first week of November. And also my friend Key will be here for a good portion. So they will be uh, some of the judges on the next contest. And I have two surprise judges that I won't announce right now, but I'm really looking forward to having uh, a bigger board of judges that are actually in concept art and doing art almost daily so that when you guys submit, you know that your art will be viewed by these artists and it will do more of like a critique because I've noticed from the last concept that you guys really liked seeing, um, just from, actually I had the winner email me even and asked if he, I could get more of a critique to him as well. So that's something I want to be doing in the next week or two. But I've noticed how important that that is probably for you guys and especially if we have a little bit more of a professional eye besides myself looking at the image I think it's good to hear a lot of feedback so that you can prove your work even further <laughs> okay so here with the arm I'm trying not to add like a highlight but I do want to separate that arm from the body a bit more Or something like that and then on the other side you can see how his belly is a bit dark on that other side and I don't want that to be the end result so I'm going to cover it up uh, Ambly says I consider to buy a Cintiq but I'm afraid I'll get neck problems have you run into any neck problems at all um no I have run into wrist problems though. I have to wear, uh, it looks like a cast every night now when I go to bed and that's kind of annoying, but it has worked pretty well. And I have to do my stretches and it's pretty much like you bend it back, you bend it this way and pull, and then you do like your hand thing that way. Uh, anyways, I have noticed that I have some wrist problems, but I think it's just because of me drawing constantly. I don't know if I can specifically blame the Cintiq for it. But in terms of neck, I haven't really uh, encountered much of an issue so far. Uh, James Frio says, in relation to today's question about painterly styles, can we post work in the chat we did experimenting with different brushes and styles? Yeah, I would love that. Actually, because I know I'm not able to see the chat after it goes through a bit. If you could even post it when you're finished, maybe on the actual community post of where this live stream is posted, then I will be able to see it too at the end. Because I'm kind of curious of uh, what other styles you guys have experimented with. Okay, the thing I think I did kind of wrong with the original mole drawing is I didn't round out his belly as much as I would have liked. So with this one, I'm going to round it out. And the goal is to round it out without adding highlights. It's kind of like one of those little challenges that it seems kind of tough at first, but once you get used to working with more of like a matte finish in your work, I think it becomes easier to recognize like where to place your your values to still create a rounded illusion without using the, the highlights. Uh, Rafa says, is the painterly style inspired by Tonko? Oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, Tonko House is pretty much my goal for the entire demo game that we're making because I fell in love with the dam keeper the, the style of the dam keeper and I've listened to dice and Roberts many times I even took their 
uh, school schoolism class on color and light. I really think they are great teachers. They're great innovators. I, I love the way they talk about art and, uh, they're definitely people that I look up to and I respect. So when it came down to the style for this game, I definitely wanted to be influenced from the dam keeper, but I wanted to apply it to more of a video game aesthetic. So it's going to be interesting because we're still doing 3d models, but then the end result will look chalky and painterly. So I'm very interested to see how this will marry, but hopefully it's a result that uh, we can be proud of. Uh, Blue1117 says, you can zoom in and out by holding spacebar plus control and drag on the screen with your pen. Might help with the wrist problem. Uh, it's not so much the zooming in, because I don't mind actually putting the two fingers in. It's more or less that I draw with my wrist rather than my arm. So it's doing this motion constantly with a pencil and a pen because I do a lot of traditional drawings and I think that's where a lot of my wrist problems stem from. Okay. So now I'm going to just add in a subtle... Ah! It looks like we got a hole. Oh, actually, holy moly. <laughs> that's my pun of the day. No, I want it to be very subtle. Because you can even see the color that I'm using. If this is considered our highlight on our color scale here, it's not even close to white. So you can see it the just by contrast alone, it looks like a super light value, but it's actually more of a medium to dark gray. Uh, Rafa says, how do you keep balance in contrast? Uh, I love contrast, so I think it's something that my eye is specifically looking for constantly in the image. And I try not to put a lot of contrast in areas that I don't want to have the focus on. So in this case, I want to have a lot of the focus on the face and his hands. So I'm putting more contrast in those areas specifically. Right, so now we can kind of detail out a little bit further. I think then we'll get into actually, I think finishing him up. I think I want to add in the whiskers, but besides that, there isn't too much details left. Uh, James Frio says, if I could recommend one thing to help you in the community with wrist issues, try this. Keep your palms upright and rotate your hands as far as they can go back and forth for a few minutes. You don't have to go fast either. Just keep a steady motion. I did this when I had serious wrist problems and it helped me out a lot. All right, so I'm going to keep my palms upright and then rotate your hands as far as they can go back and forth. Oh, yeah, that, that's one of them. That was one of uh, the videos. I, I watch a video pretty much every morning. And it's like it teaches you how to correct your wrist. But yeah, that one helps uh, immensely. Okay, let me go ahead and add in these whiskers now. So these I want to be extremely subtle. I actually don't want them to be that light of a color. Oop, that almost looks like his eyebrow. Something like that. And then essentially that is our mole. So doing concepts like this are really fun because I don't have to worry about like a perfect smoothing or a perfect blend. You can have more fun with it and not feel so concerned that it doesn't look perfect or it doesn't match exactly uh, like a true lighting system. So I might, let me, let me just try to see what a rim light would look like on this character. And if it looks all right, we'll keep it. But if not, we'll throw it away. 
And these are one of those things where I always have to test it out. I'm not the biggest fan of rim lights. I think I have kind of avoided them, but in some pieces it actually really enhances it. So I always like to at least test to see if I like the look that a rim light gives. And I typically always go with blue. I'm not too sure why. I just like the balance that a blue usually gives, like a cool blue. And it's more than just like slopping down a line down the side of them. You want to make sure that your rim light is a little bit more controlled in terms of making sure the placement is accurate. So that's why I'm going through with my eraser after I lay it down and then I'm trying to make it feel cohesive all the way throughout. Uh, oh, someone's saying that it looks like it's from a children's book. Actually, that was one of the reasons I thought about uh, leaving art school when I was in school was I wanted to be a children's book illustrator for like a good month and a half, two months. And I thought that was going to be my career path. And I, I think eventually I will do a kid's book because that's something I'm still somewhat interested in doing. But it's interesting that you said that. Because I think if I did a kid's book, it probably would be all in this kind of a style. So we're going down the arm. Oops. And there would be some underneath of him catching on this underside of the leg. <laughs> yeah, if you ever hear me like not talking or rambling about something, it's usually because I'm concentrating pretty hard. I don't hate this rim light. I mean, I'll see what it looks like after we finish. Because if it really doesn't add much to the overall effect, I, I usually like, take it out. I think sometimes, at least the way that I've used rim lights in the past, it's almost a little gimmicky, and I try to stay away from that. I like having more of like a flat finish. Let's throw some on this side just for good measure. All right, let's see what that looks like. You see what I mean with, like, I don't hate the effect it gives off. It just feels, I don't know, more simple without it. Uh, Tan Lighting says, have you ever worked on a piece for a long time and had something happen like a computer crash or you forgot to save? That happened to me and I almost burst into teary, fiery tears of rage. Uh, when I was in school, that would happen, but uh, now Photoshop has that feature where it saves your work every five minutes. So I haven't really encountered any huge frustration in like the last, I would say even like five, six years. But I remember back in the day of like not saving and then having a file close on you and yeah, that's that's frustrating. I 
I guess we'll keep the rim light. I'm not a huge fan of it. Maybe I need to just work it out a slight more, but I'll keep it. So from here, let's go ahead and just add a slight cast shadow underneath of him just to ground him a bit more. Oops. Then James Frio says, Tim, what do you listen to when you make arts, music, ambient noises, lectures, etc.?" Uh, it varies. I think with every artist, it just depends. I've listened to just lectures for an entire drawing before, but like, what was I listening to yesterday? I would say my, my taste in music ha like keeps evolving. So I would say my staples, I have like a playlist on uh, YouTube that I definitely go to that. That's like my go-to. But like yesterday, I was listening to this. <laughs> and like, it just depends on what mood I'm in. So I was painting this mole and I was just in like a happy, upbeat mood. So I was listening to this. But then most days I would say it's something more, at least to, nowadays it's more like this. Where it's more of like a classic 40, 50 time period. Uh, I'm a huge fan. Or I guess this is more of a classic. I think I used to listen to more something that was like fast. And uh, would kind of help me with my drawing in terms of speed. But now that I'm getting more comfortable, I think I like having music that reflects that. But like I said, it constantly is evolving. Who knows what I'll be into next month. I'm sure I'll be listening to a bunch of Halloween nonsense and watching Halloween movies while I work. Um, oh, you know what? Blue one 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 seven says I should change the color of the rim light to see if I like it better. You are you are correct. That actually probably would change my impression of this. Oh, you know what? I kind of like that green actually. because I think the blue we used was a bit too stark. Yeah, actually, I like that a lot better, although I have to get rid of this side, because I forgot I color picked some of the areas in here. So let me lay on that green on the other hand, and maybe I'll like this a bit more. Uh, Rafa says, Tim, if you use copyrighted music during your Twitch stream, you may it may mute it. I know, that's why I'm very careful about uh, never having music, but uh, today it slipped. Uh, hopefully it doesn't mute it, but um, if that's why you guys are have ever wondered why I don't play music while I do the streams, it's because of that reason, and hopefully so that you guys can still listen to your own music or whatever while you're watching. Because usually when I watch streamers, uh, if they don't play music, I'll play music alongside of them talking. So it's like I can hear both at the same time. I would say my favorite streamer to watch would be Psychra at the moment. Or uh, Cynix, I'm sorry. Cynix is my favorite one to watch right now just because I find his style and his brush techniques so innovative. And uh, I love how sharp, but um, very controlled. I feel like... He, he has a style that looks very chaotic, but he's very comfortable with the chaos. And I like the way that he controls it. Okay, so let me get back to our cast shadow here. Uh, Nila Hem says, I was trying to copy a colored picture via pencil drawing recently, and I came to the conclusion that it's literally impossible for human brains to accurately match grayscale values. How do you do it? Uh, to be honest, it is tough. Like, even if I turn this image grayscale right now, 
Let me grab the property menu. It's on the other screen here. So like, I, I probably would have been able to guess most of these, but some areas, maybe not so much. Because usually red will throw off what you perceive as a value. So sometimes that can be a little more tricky. But for the most part, I would say the contrast is all where I played them out in the drawing. And you can see how the nose has the most contrast to it. And that's why I was talking about before with the contrast, I wanted to make sure that the nose and the hands had the most contrast within them because that's where I want the vocal point to be. But it also lets me know that this hand here actually doesn't have that much contrast at all. So I need to go back in and add in some contrast. And I usually always recommend having a layer that you can turn on and off just to see the saturation when it's turned down and you can only see the values. And I guess it, it doesn't bother me too much that the further away hand is less in contrast because I like the, the feeling of if the arm that's in the foreground has more contrast than the arm in the background, that's okay because I would rather have the focus be more on the foreground hand than the one that's further away. But since the light source is coming from overhead, I really should add a lighter value on the top here. And then for his cast shadow, oh, I was wondering where that was coming from. I don't like to have a pure dark color. I like to throw in some lighter hues. So something like a blue, especially if he's outside. Oh man, I am picking bad colors today. Let me grab, let me redo that blue. There we go. And I'm sure you guys will notice that some days you're just, it, something will be off about whatever you're working with, whether it's your color choice, whether it's your value, whether it's your proportions, that happens. Just know that it happens to everyone. And usually the day after, uh, you'll be fine again. Since the light source is coming from in front, I want the cash shadow to be more behind him. Let's throw in... some lighter tints down here. Okay, and I think we're pretty much done. I probably wouldn't go too much further with this or else I might be entering more of like a over-rendering state of mind and I don't wanna do that. So instead, oh wow, we have a lot of time left. Guys, this is, this is unusual. Usually we don't have this much time before the stream ends. Um, let's see here. Okay. Um, I may, let me do, okay, I'm going to treat this like a real concept art since I have to pass this off to Kent in the next five hours. So why don't I go ahead and show you guys what I would do to take this to the next step. And you know what, actually, let me, I just realized we should have some, I don't like it being a pure gray. Let me throw in some of our bounce like color here. Uh, 
Oh, you know what, though? That makes the blue really stark. Maybe I don't like blue as the complementary color. Yeah, we'll make it more of like a yellow. All right, so let me go ahead and show you what I would do next before I would hand this off to a 3D modeler. So first, I definitely make the rest of the canvas filled. All right, I'm gonna merge all the layers together with Command Shift E, select all, copy, undo, and then paste. And I do that so that I have all the layers into one single layer now. So first, make a copy of it, and then let's go ahead and balance these colors here. So I love doing this part because I get to see what the image would look like with some more blue tints, with some yellow. And all I have to do is adjust a uh, adjustment bar, essentially. And this could give off a whole different feel to your piece. So you want to be careful not to over adjust. But like if I went like this, you can see how you can't even really see the character's eyes anymore. And he gets lost in this dark blue. So we probably don't want to do that. And then the opposite, it's too yellow and it, it doesn't really coordinate with the feeling we're trying to get off here. Probably something like that. Originally, I, I was thinking of the mole being more of a, a cool tint, but I actually like him being more of a warm color scheme here. Yeah, something like that. Um, Ambly says, I think a warmer shadow would be a nice contrast for the green rim light. Yeah, maybe we could try that. Let's see what that would look like. And I also think this is way too harsh down here. Well, we definitely made the whole scene now more warm. So it'd probably work best if we had more of a cool shadow. And that's what color balance will do. You can easily alter whether an image looks and feels more warm or cool. And you can do that very quickly. Uh, Eve says, concerning rim light, how do you avoid when you have a light source from behind that the rim light bleeds into the light source and it starts to look odd? I feel like rim light often needs a harsh contrast on its edge, but sometimes you just don't have that. Yeah, typically with rim light, you want it to be a very harsh edge. It's because it's lit from behind and it's a very strong light and that's what gives it. it its main purpose is to edge it out from the background. It separates the subject matter from the background. So I would work with a stronger rim light. If you have a soft rim light, you actually might be entering more into like a bounce light territory, and that has more of a rounded feel to it. So if you're going to work with rim light, you want that rim light to be a bit stronger than the light sources that you have around. Okay, let me see what this looks like. Okay, I like our, I like our little mole that we got here. So I'm going to merge that down. Let's move him over just slightly. All right, so from here, what I would probably end up doing is giving just a short, quick view of what he would look like from different angles. So in the case of our mole, let's go ahead and do that really quick. So now you get to see me do some quick sketching here. So I think his overall shape has more of like a plump bottom to his head. 
So like if he was talking to you straight on, it'd probably be something like this. So when I'm doing quick sketch, I like to work fast and I try my best not to overthink things. So usually I like to give some like emotion sheets as well. In this case, I think I want to do a, a straightforward just because for a 3D modeler, it really does help having like a true to form turnaround. So probably after the stream ends and after I get food, I'll probably give more of a turnaround for Kent to work with. Like I said, I love drawing these kind of things because it's basically like a potato. That I can uh, work with here. And if you're ever doing like a straight on shot like this, usually you only have to focus on drawing half of the creature or whatever it is you're working on and then just copy and paste and then flip what you've already done. Which I will definitely do for this guy as well. Uh, James Rio says, what are you gonna be doing in England by the way? Uh, pretty much, I'm pretty sure Tigil was the one that started this, but Tigil and a bunch of people that watch these streams almost on a weekly basis decided that they wanted to meet together in person. And since a lot of the people that watch these streams are kind of near the European area, they decided to rent a house in London and uh, just kind of like hang out and meet each other and just have a good time. So they sent me the invitation and... I remember thinking at first, like, oh, no, I don't think I can. Like, I don't know what I'll be doing. And uh, financially, I don't know if it, it would be a uh, good time, whatever. And then I thought about it. And then I really thought, like, you know what? No, Tim, you're, you're crazy. Like, just go. Like, there's no reason and no excuse I could think of as to why I shouldn't go. So I am super excited to meet uh, the, the gang that is going to be over there. And I, the purpose for going there is literally just to have a good time. I'm pretty sure we're going to Hogwarts one day, and I'm really excited for that. I haven't looked up anything about it, so I have no idea what to expect. So I'm hoping that'll be like a nice uh, surprise. All right, so now in terms of the head shape that we have right now, it's a little too small. His head is actually a little wider. So I can just open up Liquify, push it over. Now this is what I was talking about earlier where I can just work on one half of him and then when I'm ready, I'll go ahead and make a copy, flip it, and connect it and you'll see how that works. Actually, his nose goes a little higher. It's more like here. Uh, Nail Hillum says, Tim, you're crazy, said Tim to himself. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how it went. That was my conversation with myself. It was very short. I got to the facts quickly. Okay, so then... Why, thank you, Melissa764, for following. All right, so now that I'm feeling a little better with the shape, I might pull down the arm slightly, something like that, and then move the eye over. Feel pretty good about that. Make a copy of it, paste, edit, transform, flip horizontal, and bam. We now have a mole. So you can see how I do have some stitching problems, though. I want his head to be like that big, I think. 
So even looking at this, I can tell, okay, I need to spread the legs a bit further apart. So I'm going to do that first. All right, now let's try it. All right, yeah, I'm feeling better about this. Well, I thank you, Marissa Art, for following. Okay, so I can still tell the forehead looks a bit too small. Some of the cuteness from the mole comes from having such a large forehead, and I want to keep that intact. It's funny, I feel like this is what I would be norm doing on a normal work day, so you guys get to see like what I do on a day to day with CG Cookie. Now, I got to be careful when I'm editing post the copy and flip because it might not be completely symmetrical, but. Kent is such a good 3D modeler that I don't have to worry too much because he'll be able to adjust in Blender if needed. All right, let's see what that looks like. I think the other thing that I need to do is this light feels way off. Uh, James Frio says, I can actually make hear you making the marks on your Cintiq. You should make an ASMR video of rain and Cintiq marks. Who says I haven't? <laughs> okay, let me try copying and pasting this. That uh, feels a little better. Make it bigger. Uh, yeah, that feels about right. Okay, so now with our mole pretty much in the standing position, I'm going to show you guys, and I did a tutorial on this, but I'll show you guys my quick way of doing a front view and then back view pretty quickly. Okay. I'm going to make, I'm going to first name the layer because I'm so good at naming all my layers. Make a copy of it just by holding, dragging it down to the new layer. And actually, let me make this file bigger. Now, normally with a concept that really is this simple, Kent is such a good 3D modeler that he may not even need a turnaround sheet. But I think just as good practice, I want to show you guys how you can do it pretty quickly.
move the front one over. Now this will be our back view. Now this is important because with the concept that we did, we can't actually see the back of him. We don't know if he has a tail. These are things that the 3D modeler would then have to come back to me and figure out. So instead, I'm gonna show you guys how to create a quick back view. So first thing you do, erase all the contents of the front view. Pretty much it'll be like an empty looking silhouette. And then I always like to look at where the line ends and continue it. So in terms of his hat, I don't want to delete it just yet because I want to follow that line. Wrap it around here so that it carries that same angle. And this is another good thing of like being able to see in more of like a 3D space. And now I can go ahead, delete that. You can see how it now looks like he's wearing this hat. And we won't be able to see inside of the flashlight part of his helmet. So I'm going to delete that. You would probably actually see more of like the back of the flashlight. Something like that. And then if this was a human character, which I know this is far from, but then I would work on adding in like the back muscles, the little lines in the back, and then uh, work up the back of the arms, these kind of stuff. I mean, this could be like a very swole looking mole, but I think we're going to go stay away from it looking like a bodybuilder. So instead, we're going to have his hands coming back. He kind of has like a forward position where his belly is hanging forward and his arms are hanging back slightly. He has more of a rump. Like that. Now, I've found out moles actually do have tails, but I'm going to Google this. Because, I mean, I'm not looking for 100% accuracy on a real mole but I think taking inspiration from a real mole and then applying it to a cartoon or animated style version of your mole is the best way to go. So then if we look at like the scientific study of a mole, you can see how it has more of like a long skinny tail. And I think that's great and all, but I don't think our cartoon mole will have a very long tail. I think it might be more of like a little triangle. Something like that. And there would be a crease where the back of his head is. And then I usually give like little elbow indications. Uh, Xerox Kuru sa Kuro says, do you have any tips on learning how to work on a bigger canvas? I have a really time, hard time drawing bigger digitally. Uh, yeah, I think when we're working on a bigger canvas, just know, make sure that your computer can handle the performance speed because sometimes when you go with a larger canvas size, it'll like severely slow down your computer. So I think besides that though, you just have to get comfortable looking at your image as a whole Look at it not so much like piece by piece, but look at it as an entire composition. And that has helped me with my own digital work with my larger compositions and not zooming in too soon. So stay zoomed out, really lay down solid values that you feel comfortable with and make really good progress before you do any of those uh, detailing. Uh, <laughs> James Frio says, swole looking mole. Yep, that's what we got here. And now usually if I have like a front and back, I'll just also write it above them. Front. Front to back. And now 
if you didn't erase too much when you line them up, it should still line up perfectly, which in this case it does. It creates a really weird looking image. So I'm going to go ahead and re-separate those. And there we go. Now, how much time do we have left? So we have like 20 minutes left. Man, we really made good time today, didn't we, guys? Uh, I could do a side view really quick. This one's a little more tough. I can show you at least how to, I would start it. Okay, so I'm gonna make these a touch smaller. Make a new layer. And pretty much when you're doing side views, you just need to make sure that the proportions are lining up. So I like to make lines that go all the way across to indicate for me as to where something either begins or ends. And I'm looking for prominent areas. So like the top of the flashlight, bottom of the flashlight, the bottom of the helmet, the top of the helmet, eye line, bottom of his claw, bottom of his little tail, his butt. Oh, where his elbows are, hand placement, usually like the tips of each finger I'll do. And it may get overwhelming, but I, I find that the more lines, it actually helps me out more. But for you, it might be a bit too much and you're like, I can't handle this many lines, take them off. So let's see here. I'll make the opacity a lot smaller, smaller as Key would say. And let's make a new layer. Well, I thank you, Kristen Braitman, for following. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Tan Lightning says, any tips for drawing better traditionally? Bigger. Oh, yeah, that is definitely a little bit more of a challenge. This is, I don't know how well you guys can see this. Hold on. Let me move this aside. All right, so this is my two-foot drawing that I started at the beginning of the year. And I've made some good progress, but you can see this side still needs a lot of work. So working bigger, it's definitely like a trial of patience. I'm, I'm learning that I do like it, but it's definitely a bit of a challenge. So my, my advice with that is be patient and don't uh, get frustrated, which I know it definitely can be. Oh yeah, look at, look at what I found on clearance at a, um, a grocery store actually. It was 20 bucks, and it was on clearance. So I was like, yeah, I, could, I should have that. Like, I could carry my sketchbooks, and when I go to cons, there's, like, pencil cases and stuff in here. So I'm really excited to uh, wear that out when I'm uh, out at conventions. Um, Nahilam says, you should play a game of League of Legends for the last 20 minutes of the stream. Uh, I actually uninstalled League of Legends on my computer, even though I was, like, a huge fan of the game. But uh, actually, for people that really enjoy League, they released an art book that is free to view, and I'll link to it, unless if one of you guys have the link readily available. But uh, it, was, it came out, I think, last week, and it's pretty cool. It doesn't have all the art from like every character, but it has a good amount where it's still, still worth the viewing, I would say, because a lot of the concept sketches I haven't seen uh, until then, until they just released it. So it was really cool seeing some of those. And one of my friends that I actually graduated school with, he works at Riot with his older sister. Uh, his name's Paul Hoffner, and he was credited with a lot of the art and uh, some of the more sketchy stuff that's in that book. So huge congrats to Paul, and I'm really glad that uh, Riot's still doing well because I, I really do like the art that they make for that game. Okay, so as I'm doing the side view here, I definitely want to still look at it as a potato and I'm trying to visualize it in a 3D space. I will separate the arm from the body and I usually put the arm uh, either to the right or to the left of the character and it's for the 3D modeler so that the arm doesn't get in the view of whatever might be on the side of their body. So I leave more of like a circle as to where that arm would be placed. See the tail goes. And I'm looking at all those individual lines that I drew. So if you're good at matching things up, maybe doing side views is like 
your hidden talent that you may not have even know that you had. So at the top, let me, and I'll go back and I add lines all the time. Because I need to see exactly where things end and begin. And I don't always, I, I may like forget a few of those lines that I really should be adding in. Ah, thank you, Tizzle. Yes, that is the art book I am talking about. And it is pretty awesome to look through. I didn't know though at first, you can scroll down. So when you go to the character pages, it may look like there's only one or two pieces of art. But if you just scroll, there's actually a lot more than just one or two. And honestly, Riot was, if I didn't get a job at CG Cookie right out of school, I think Riot would have been the company that I would have uh, try to apply for and get into just because I really admire the art that comes out of the splash screens from the characters. And that was around the time, uh, when was it? I think Jinx, that character design of Jinx, uh, came out just a little after I graduated. And I remember being so in love with the story behind how she was created, her concept art in general, and then the end result that I was like, yes, this is, these are the kind of people that I, if I was in the industry, I would want to surround myself and learn from and uh, hopefully get better. So, yeah, if you can't tell, I'm kind of a fan of Riot. So, like, right here, I definitely should have a line for the top of the nose. And then for the side view, you may get stuck at a few points. Just know that that happens. And side views are probably one of the most frustrating things to do just because you don't have like a 3D representation of what it would look for, like from the side. And a lot of it is guesswork, but you want to minimize that as much as possible. And that's why these lines really do help. So this eye line is like there. Bottom of his little mouth piece is there. And I, I mean, obviously this one's a little easier because it's not a human character where it's more of a potato, so I, you can have a little bit more liberty with the sizing of things, which is kind of nice. But you still want to take it seriously because in the real industry out there, you might be working on a game or a movie or something where the characters are more cute and you don't want to just uh, get lazy with the way that you're drawing things just because you think it's easy. Like You still want to give it the best interpretation that you possibly can and make it as easy for the 3D modeler as possible. Because if you get on good terms with your 3D modeler, then uh, your job will be a lot more smooth than if you were constantly like fighting and bickering because that's when there's uh, some trouble and you don't want to get yourself in that kind of a mess. You want to be friends with your 3D modelers. You don't want to like be enemies. And then his lamp comes down. So it's like a potato wearing a helmet, essentially, is what we have here. And I, I kind of like the over-exaggeration of the light. Well, I thank you, Lex Dragon, for following. It almost gives more of like a cartoony vibe. Like we could even add more of like a bubble coming out of it, but I think we decided to keep it more flat as a team. Okay, there really isn't, there's more of like a smooth transition from his mouth to his belly, so I don't want to put in too much of a dip. I think just instinctually I was putting more of a dip, but it really doesn't have that much of a dip. Something like that. Okay, and then the last part would be to do, do the arm. So the way that I'm going to do the arm, and I'm going to name my layers because I'm once again so good at doing that as you can tell so I'm gonna go ahead and make a new layer I'm gonna draw right on top of our side layer and then when I finish I'll just move the layer to the side so he essentially has three massive 
rectangular fingers. Do you know what? I actually might make that four. I might have to change the original concept just a touch. I like the idea of having four arms or four fingers. And then these are the two thumbs actually, and he has two main fingers. I think just because I like throwing in things that are actually from reality. So the fact that moles do have two thumbs, I think it would be cool if we represented in the, the concept. Okay, you don't really have to do too much besides that. And then you put it, oh, wait, let me draw the top of it. And we put it to the side. So now if I zoom out, let me go ahead. Actually, I know how I'm going to, I was like, how can I make this canvas bigger without just keep stretching it to one side? I'm going to make this taller. And then, oops, there we go. And I'm just going to fill in that background color with that green. It's like a green gray. Fill it in. I'm literally going to make a copy of the concept that we have. Oh, wait, where did our... Oh, you know what? When we did that, it actually filled in, the paint bucket filled in some of the shadow color that I had with the mole. So I don't want that. So let me go ahead and change this. Let me see if there's any questions while I do this. Nilahelm says, so the lines help with the placement of things on a side view, but do you still just have to kind of eyeball the shape still? Well, the things that the lines can do is mainly help with your proportions. But what it can't do is it can't show you like how wide his stomach is or how far back in space something is with that. So there is some guesswork, but if you kind of know the character that you drew, it shouldn't be that hard to figure out where or how far the proportion should go. Let me get rid of that. Actually, we could even make this smaller. Uh, McKinney is in says, if you have a solid pose of a character fully rendered, is there a point to fully render the turnaround or is it better to keep it as line art? Uh, from my experience with working with 3D modelers, they do not want a rendered turnaround. They would rather have line art to work from. Now that could definitely vary per uh, 3D modeler, but I, in the five years that I've worked with CG Cookie and even with uh, the freelance work that I've done, they've never wanted a colored rendered turnaround. I think because they would rather have a really nice rendered uh, illustration piece of the character and then the turnaround just be more uh, for 3D purposes, like literally you just for modeling, you want a nice rendered turnaround. Or if like you do it for a movie, I, I have seen some concept art books where specifically for a movie, they want it to be more rendered just so they can see some of the, I guess, so they can see some of the color and fabric. But I'm, I'm telling you, like 90% of the time, just line art. Ooh, sorry. All right, so now I'm going to move these over so it's not so squished. Let's see if we have another question here. Uh, James Frio says, any tips on world domination or conquering the human race? Yes. Kill them with kindness. It works every time. Uh, how old am I? Uh, I am actually uh, 26, but my birthday is later this month. I'm a Libra and I will be turning 27. It's that weird, scary feeling of I feel younger than, well, actually, I feel like everywhere I go, I still get carded. And uh, people treat me like I'm 21, 22. But uh, I'm, in, I'm gonna be in my late 20s and that's a weird feeling. So yeah, if any of you out there are in the same boat that I am, it's, it's a weird feeling where like, I'm not, I'm not a youngin anymore. Uh, Tan Lightning says, I guess you could say he's Mel <laughs> Melatado. 
I don't know if I understand that one. Uh, Terminal Glow says, I think you might have messed up the lamp a little bit. The lower line on the side view doesn't really match the one on the front view. Uh, let me see. Oh, you're right. Let me go ahead and edit that. So what uh, he was saying was, you can see how the top of this lamp, I should have drawn a line for that. It should actually be higher up on my side view. And that's why I'm telling you, the more lines, the better, because you might get caught where you're like, oh, that's that should line up here. And the more you look at it, you're like, oh, okay, let me adjust that. So thank you for pointing that out. And that's why it's good to have line art like this, where it's so easy to edit it on the fly that like even something like that, I can go in and be like, oh, okay, let me do a quick pass on it and we're done. Actually, I kind of liked it being more cartoony like that. Yeah, I like that better. All right, so I'm gonna move the side and the arm over. Back over. Now, with these lines, I usually have them at a much lower opacity for the final, and then I'll make a new layer and I'll make a darker kind of solid line to ground them, something like that. So you can see how these lines are still present, but a lot lighter, something like that. And typically that's kind of my process for creating concept art for the CG cookie team. So I'm actually surprised we did so much in the last two hours because usually I'm, I'm rambling about something and my time gets filled with that. Uh, McKinney is in says he just hit 20 or I, Oh, it scrolled down. Hold on. Uh, McKinney says just hit 27 myself. I feel you. Yeah. It's definitely a weird feeling being in late twenties. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, everyone tells me I look younger than my age. I was even at, if you guys know what five hour energy drinks are in America, you get carded if you look under 18 and I went to go get one about four months ago and I was carded and I was 26. Could you imagine a 26 year old going into a store to buy something that you can legally purchase at 18 and then show, having to show your ID for it? So it's one of those moments where you're like, really? Really? I don't look 18? Really? So that was an interesting uh, time in my life. Okay, so uh, this is generally, if you are guys are interested in doing like character concept art, this process should become like secondhand nature to you where you can quickly, or not, I shouldn't say quickly, but you should definitely uh, have a character in mind. You're able to render and sketch it out in detail. And obviously you're going to go back and forth with with critiques from your art director, or whoever is your supervisor, or whoever is your freelance uh, person. And once you have that finished, then you'll move on to doing a turnaround of the character. And usually this is required for any movie, game, or uh, if, I mean, sometimes the your client will want this, even if it's not a movie or game, but I would say almost always uh, they'll need it if it's a movie or a game. Now, with something like this type of a character, you might not actually have to do a turnaround because it's so simple, but you may have to tell your 3D modeler like little tips of, oh, in the back he has a tail that's a little triangle and stuff like that. But for the most part, uh, this character is pretty simplistic. So, okay, let me see if there's any other questions, and then I think we're going to call this one done. I think this was a, this was an oddly fast stream. So, okay. Uh, Sipo Day says, do you think it's important at the intermediate when someone is studying, et cetera, to have monitor with wide gamut, you were even 15. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, pretty much when I'm working, I always work in RGB, unless if I'm working for something that I know specifically will be for a print, then I do change my mode to CMYK. But since this is something that is purely for uh, online and digital, I, I keep it RGB. I haven't really messed with my gamuts that much, to be honest. So I don't think uh, I could give you a solid piece of advice on that, but usually the standard setting that Photoshop opens up with, I've, I've used that and I really haven't found too much of a problem with it. Uh, Terminal Glow says I'm 22, but everyone who meets me thinks I'm 13 or 15. I, that's kind of the problem I ran into when I was actually 21. <laughs> they thought I was much younger. 
Uh, James Frio says, when I used to work at a company, I was the youngest person in the department. Everyone would say things like, oh, you're so young. You're so lucky to be here at such a young age. It was unsettling. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't mind being, like, even with uh, CG Cookie, I'm, I'm the youngest member of the crew, but I, they, I never felt, I never felt it. They always treated me with respect, and that's, some, that's one of the reasons I have always stuck with CG Cookie. Uh, Rafa says, Tim, is there a stream dedicated to light? That is something I can definitely do a stream on in the future. I would put it, though, in the suggestion box below. So under the Twitch box, you can see how there's uh, a community suggest link. If you click it, put it there, because that's where I actually do read all of what you guys want to see. And then I, uh, I'll pick out uh, from there what I'm going to do. Uh, Nebula Fox says, he means the color range Oh, of the monitor. You know what? Yes, I have actually noticed there's a difference in my Cintiq versus the monitor that I normally work off of with my Mac, and there is a color difference. Sometimes I don't even recognize the color difference until I move the image onto my first monitor, and I see the difference. So that is actually something I need to look into because I, I do notice the difference, and it does bother me a little bit. So I guess I'll have a better answer once I get into actually editing that more. Okay, I think we're done. So, okay, thank you guys for coming to this live stream. This was definitely an interesting one. I didn't think we would be able to get through all of that, but uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, next week, I will be doing the complicated fabric and how to draw like complicated folds on um, with not only fabric, but on like jeans on, and put it into more of a practical use because it's really neat like drawing fabric hanging from a ceiling and then drawing the bunches at the bottom. But I think it's good then to apply that knowledge into a practical reasoning of like, uh, I want to draw a very long draped character. And that might be like a cloak or uh, if you get more into like fabric that is more thin, then you want to have more of like a flow to it and then show how it crumples on the floor. So we will go over that next week. And let me see. Is there any other big announcements? Oh, uh, I, I know I keep mentioning this, but I'm really excited for this draw Halloween thing. I don't I haven't talked to the person that invented this, but I really like it. I've already, I kind of have cheated a little bit because uh, I got so excited. I started doing like little thumbnails of what I think might be cool for some of the days. So I'm really excited to start that. If you guys are into drawing a day or like doing daily doodles, this is something that I would recommend doing with me. And I think it would be cool to see like what ideas we come up with with each day. Like one of them would be, uh, let's see what's on here. Uh, uh, Mummy Monday. Like some of them are more obvious. They're like witch, Frankenstein, and vampire. But they put it in a way that where you can kind of interpret it differently. So like Phantom Friday. I mean, you could do more of a, like a Phantom of the Opera, but you could also take it more into like how do you interpret the word Phantom? Or even like uh, Black Catter Day uh, on Saturday. But obviously it's something that represents more of like a feline subject matter so like you don't just have to draw like a black cat you can interpret that into like maybe a personification of a character and go from there so i'm really excited for this if you can't tell halloween is something that i'm really passionate about uh, i'll be in london in two weeks so I, i'm really excited to see the people that will be there i'm so glad that you guys set that up i actually got the money in this morning you know what you guys have so much more interesting colored money than we do in the states like even the drawings where where was that I think it's on your $5 bill. Where's the $5? I shouldn't call them bills. They're really pounds. Oh, yeah. Like, look on the back. Look at this. Look at this drawing. Look how cool. That's so cool. Like, we don't have that kind of stuff on ours. I mean, I guess we do have some things that are cool on the dollar bill, but I always find other countries' money more interesting. So I'm really excited to go to London. I've never been to Europe, and this will give me kind of a taste for next year because I'm planning to go to a Germany convention and Belgium. So if you guys are out in that area, I will definitely be out there, and I would love to meet you guys. So, okay, thank you guys, and uh, let's see if there's any last-minute questions. Uh, let's see here. Oops. Uh, Flamaru says, I never question when people card me because for the most part they're forced to, and if they don't, they get written up or fired. Also true, so I can respect that. And James Frio says, wins the next contest. It starts October 1st. We do the, the Halloween one every year, and it starts at the beginning of October and will end at the very end of October. So I'm excited for that one. 
And no, I will not tell you what the contest is yet, even though I, I kind of have an idea of what it will be. Uh, Irish Whiskey says, uh, come to Ireland and said, eventually I will go to Ireland because I am Irish, so I think it would be good if I eventually went. Uh, thank you, Raw Gamolge. I, I think that said Raw Gaming. Thank you for following. Okay, you know what? Yes, I will post a giant thing of Draw Halloween on the community post, so I'll probably do that tomorrow. So I'll look for that. Okay, I'm done talking. Thank you guys so much for coming, and hopefully we'll see you next week when we're going to be doing our fabric folding. Okay.